is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Deadwood, season three, episode one. Tell your God to ready for blood. In this episode, remember that thing I said about how Hearst seems to have a conscience? I may have to take it back. There is... There's a lot of things that I hoped for these characters that it seems like at the start of this season are not going to come to pass after all. This was a little tough. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Uh, I want to say out of the gate, I have already mentioned this to Patrick, who is here live in the chat, who is sponsoring this episode. So thank you again, Patrick, for sponsoring this. Um, If you can hear a cat purring in the background, that is because she is right here and I am holding her because that's how she stays calm. And she is basically right underneath the microphone. So um, forgive me if you can hear that. And I hope that a cat purring is very soothing to you and uh, does not cause you anxiety. Um, so guys, this episode, it seems to be maybe a month, maybe a little more since the end of season two, there's not like a huge, like year jump, like there is at the beginning of season two, but there's definitely been a passage of time because we have several things that are going on that are new. Um, the, I mean, almost barely showing yet. So that's part of how I'm gauging how much time has passed as well. But um, there's the Shea Me, Joni's attempt at having a brothel of her own, has been converted into a school. And she is living in a new hotel, um, which I don't think I actually saw the name of the hotel. But the guy who's running it is like this cranky fucking British dude. And it really seems like Joni's maybe the only person staying there. Um, I don't maybe it's more like a boarding house. I'm not really sure what the difference is between those things, actually, if I'm being honest. Um, But Joni and Jane are really the two when I said in the opening that I was hoping for something and it looks like that's not going to happen. They were the ones that I meant. Because I had such hopes that they would be, that they would be able to get some sort of new business going, not necessarily a brothel, but something that they could make use of that building and partner up and be friends. And it really just seems like they did, like Joni didn't know what to do with the building. The proposition of a school was just too like good a deed for her to pass up because Joni's a good person. And I really feel like somebody comes at her and is like, Hey, we could really use this. She would have a hard time saying no to something that's like beneficial for children, beneficial for the community and educating kids so that they don't wind up with no options the way that she kind of has. So I respect her giving the building away or selling it or whatever happened, but It bums me out to see that she is on the verge of suicide practically every day. Like she's having a really bad time while Jane is kind of also in that situation. At the end of season two, it looked like Jane was starting to clean her act up a little bit. And we saw her sober for an entire episode, which like does not happen with her. And it really got me excited that she and Joni were good for each other. And it just seems like that was a blip. And you know, that really happens. Like that's part of the thing with addiction, especially that you have these, these moments of seeming to do better and it gets everybody's hopes up. It gets your own hopes up and the hopes of everybody around you who has been watching you suffer and struggle. And 
th- that makes the heartbreak when you slide back into your addiction all the more terrible for everybody involved, including yourself, because you feel like you're proving again that you are completely unable to control your own behavior. And that's a really scary place to be. And you can see how Jane does not want to be in this place. Like, there, there's a real vibe to her drinking here that feels different than it did. And I think that's due to the fact that she was off the sauce for a little while. So coming back to it feels more significant now and more of an admission of defeat. And I can't help but wonder if it's partially to do with what's going on with Joni and her frustration over that. Um, Patrick says, I blame size survival for Joni's state of mind. Yeah. So let's talk about that. I kind of figured because the show didn't end with Sai's death, or at least show his death in the, in the season finale, that he wasn't really dead. However, I was hopeful that either I was wrong or that it was going to be a kind of like slow death. And it still may be like he's not doing well in this episode. He's clearly still recovering from this wound. And I don't know if it's infected or what has happened, but being stabbed in the gut is like, you know, that's a tough thing to come back from, especially in an era where you couldn't like, you couldn't get in there and clean things out and separate like um, stomach acid from seeping and causing sepsis and all of this stuff. So I was, I'm, I'm still like low key, like, Maybe he can just still die, hopefully. But what has what has happened for now is that Psy has been neutered, basically. And that puts him in an even worse temper than he usually has. He had already been low-key neutered because of the fact that Hurst was clearly not interested in like dealing with him. And because he overplayed his hand and because Francis killed himself and he like lost his like bargaining chip there. Um, but this feels like when there's a physical malady, we saw the way that like Al had to pretend he was doing better than he was. The, we saw how he basically just had to hide. And, I wonder how many people know how badly off Sai is. I feel like he got stabbed so publicly that there's no hiding it. And I can't help but feel like that's going to have a long-term effect on everything. And it would be so amazing if he died and Joni could like take his spot. I just want Joni to have something to hold on to. And she's so obviously desperate to get back in there and con- take control again. And I don't want her to do that while Sai is still a factor. And, you know, she's just at, she's at loose ends. She hasn't got anything of her own right now, except going and, and waiting on him and checking on the girls, even though she doesn't work there anymore. It's not really her job or her place, really. But she needs something. And I wish so much that there was there was some way that she could even help out at the school. I completely understand being that she is an ex sex worker that parents in this era would and in today's era also would not be enthusiastic about her being around their children. That's just, you know, that's a fact of life. But I wish that there was something like that that she could get involved in. And I I wonder exactly how much she wound up like getting for the building as well. Is she living off of that money or was it sort of taken over by somebody? Like, I don't know how that kind of thing works in this town and the school being like basically public, but Deadwood doesn't have like, you know, a government really. I wonder how that worked and, and exactly how she's being compensated, if at all. Um, so yeah, Joni and Jane... I I just want so badly for things to work out for the two of them and for them to partner up somehow. And I really was hopeful 
that the start of this season would see that happening. And it just apparently, no. And that's, I'm not mad because I feel like the show is really representing the reality of human nature. And we tend to default when things get a little challenging or when there are big changes, we tend to slip back into things that we are familiar with and comfortable with. So Jane going back to drinking and Joni going back to Psy, total totally makes sense. Completely, you know, and especially we slip back into things that we're familiar with that are, you know, sort of self-destructive a lot of the time as well. So these two women are just some, I feel like there's like so much potential there and it's really difficult to watch them both separate of one another make what boils down to the same mistake of giving up and not trusting one another and going into something together. And maybe with Charlie Utter. I'm just saying, I still kind of want Charlie Utter to like team up with Joni somehow. Um, so with that said, I just wanted to get that out of the way at the beginning um, because they are the two that probably out of everybody made the least progress um, in the direction that I was hoping for. In terms of most progress, we have Ellsworth, who is living in a house now with uh, Alma and Sophia, who is talking a whole lot. And Sophia, like on the way to school, um, is saying hi to all these other kids, which, you know, other than... uh, Other than William and the one kid that William like made friends with who was leaving, um, William was like the only other child that we saw. And the kid that he had made friends with, we saw as he was leaving. So I really don't even count that one. We have not seen a lot of children around the camp at all. And the fact that there's a little knot of kids here makes it seem like Deadwood's really starting to get settled. This is a place where people are raising families and bringing families. And that sort of changes the dynamic of the whole camp. The fact that they have have enough children to establish a school is pretty, it's a pretty big deal. Um, And I'm really happy to see that Martha has, has decided to continue and, and take it upon herself to educate these kids. I'm sure it goes a long way towards I don't want to say like easing her grief because I feel like grief doesn't ease necessarily, but I think it probably helps distract her and make her feel that as much as she isn't raising a child of her own, she is assisting in the bringing up and education of a group of kids. And that's still her making a difference in the world. Um, I'm really wondering if Martha's going to wind up pregnant, but I don't have a good sense of whether her and Seth are boning or not because Things have been so strained between the two of them. I wouldn't be surprised if they aren't and haven't for a little while. Um, It would be a tough thing. You know, I'm, I don't know. It's uh, so yeah, that the whole thing with the school and the fact like, and I know that the show did this on purpose, but they have her reading some sentences aloud for the children to write down. And she's using, She's using sentences um, with words that are, uh, what are they called? Synonyms are when things mean the same thing. Homonyms are when they sound the same, but they are spelled differently, I think. So like when she's saying a woman does not choose a man who chews tobacco, both words sound the same, but the kids have to know enough to, you know, figure out which word is which. But then she goes into things like, The Indians can be very cruel or there's one about how the Jews own banks or things like, like super racist example sentences. And I really feel like the writers had to have run across like a book of examples of sentences that contained actual shit like this. And they were like, well, we definitely have to include this because that's insane. Um, And it's a real, like, there's a couple moments where she's reading these sentences and you get the vibe that she's kind of, like, not super jazzed about what they're saying, especially the one about the Indians can be very cruel. Um, 
but her husband wasn't killed by Indians. I, like, right? He was killed by soldiers in the war, I thought. I don't remember how that went. Um, so I'm, I was trying to sort of get a bead on why she had the reaction she did with that. But, uh, it was a, I, I thought a nice touch. The show really does not shy away from being honest about what people were like and how they spoke and how completely like unflinching they were about it. Um, and in that vein, I would like to talk about this guy whose name I always forget, the one that was at odds with the general last season and tarred him and now has apparently taken over the livery. Um, Steve. Thank you, Patrick. Steve is such a like boring name that I completely. Yeah. Um, Steve, he is like really getting up in uh, this dude's face. who's about to run against Seth for sheriff and the guy who's running against Seth he works with Tom Nuttall as the bartender there and he is not even in like he doesn't really want to win you don't even just get the sense that he's not going to win you get the sense he doesn't really want to win he's running because he sort of feels like he should like somebody should be up against Seth and he needs to like maybe branch out a little bit like he's sort of bored of just being a bartender and is just experimenting with doing some other stuff which I respect but Steve, like, wants this guy to promise him personally that if he becomes mayor, he'll let Steve keep the livery because it was abandoned by the general and um, Hostetler. And there were a bunch of animals. So somebody had to go in and, like, take care of these animals or else they were going to, you know, die of starvation. And Steve feels like he stepped in. He is taking care of them. It, this entire business has essentially been abandoned. And as far as he's concerned, he owns it now and he's put in the work and he is, you know, he feels like he is entitled to take over this business that evidently nobody wants. Now I understand his point to, a, to a degree. I would be surprised if that was the last we ever saw of Haas Settler and the general. But as of right now, assuming that they, like, if I were Steve, assuming that these guys aren't coming back, I would want to keep it as well. I would feel like I put in all this work and nobody else stepped up and, you know, somebody has to take it. And it just happened to be sort of my good luck that it fell into my lap. Um, but the bartender does not want to commit himself. And I have to say that I really admired him for this. Because it would have been so easy for him to just tell Steve what he wants to hear. And there's nothing riding on it for him. He's aware that he's like unlikely to win. So even if he made a promise, getting held accountable for that promise is almost guaranteed to not happen. So he could tell Steve anything he wanted and there'd probably be no consequences whatsoever. And he would just get Steve off of his back in this moment. But he doesn't do that. And I was genuinely kind of impressed because he wants to be honest with him about the fact that he would obey the law and he would try and like look at what the rules are regarding dealing with abandoned property. And he would want to like play it by the book. And that's making me think that even if something were to happen and Seth didn't run, maybe this guy wouldn't be terrible at his job. Like, I don't think he would be as good as Seth. And later on, Charlie Utter does point out, like, you remember how dumb that bartender was. Like, do you really think the can is better off with that guy than with you? But I really think that somebody who is willing to stand up to somebody who's essentially like a, a, a valued customer and a, a friend, I say loosely. Oh, Patrick's over here saying, plus nobody likes Steve, so I don't think Harry wants to humor him. Yeah, but, but it's not even like wanting to humor him. Cause it's just wanting to shut him up. You know what I mean? Like, that's the sort of thing that I feel like if I were in his position, I'd be like, oh, my God, stop talking. Yeah, sure. I'd let you keep it. Just shut up. You know, like, and he doesn't he's not willing. And that takes a little bit more spine than I expected from him. So what I'm saying is we haven't had the election yet. We haven't had the speeches. They were postponed. And if this dude winds up with some sort of power in some way, 
I'm not going to be that mad about it. I feel like he's at least somebody that would be you could reason with and talk to. And if he didn't understand an issue, you could have a discussion with him and he would like listen and try to educate himself. He seems like an open minded person. And uh, that's all I ask a lot of the time. You don't have to be super intelligent and you don't have to be perfect, but you need to be willing to learn. And he seems like that type. So, and thank you for giving me his name as well, Patrick Harry. Um, I just, I, I didn't expect to give a shit about this little, you know, this other dude, but I really enjoyed what, what is it that um, Nuttle says something like, Hey, maybe instead of running for public office, you can just keep bartending and let people punch you in the face. I hollered. That was like one of the best lines of this entire show. I swear to God, you could just, uh, you know, keep bartending and let people punch you in the face. I died. That was so good. Um, so in terms of why the speeches are put off, we have to back it up and talk about Hearst again. So the episode starts off with Al surveying his kingdom as he does. And Dan telling him, I feel like this, uh, there's something brewing downstairs that's going to get violent. And he turns out to be quite correct. There is indeed something brewing that is going to get violent. Um, there are a group of three Cornish dudes at the bar. And this guy is sitting at a table behind them, really goading them. And I didn't get the relationship between the guy at the table and the guys at the bar. But evidently... The dude who's sitting at the table is a, like, supervisory dude from one of Hearst's claims. And these Cornishmen are working for him. And he basically pretends that, like, this guy came at him and takes it as an excuse to shoot the dude dead in Al's bar. And Al is absolutely convinced that Hearst set this up and is waiting to see how Al reacts and how Seth reacts. And honestly, it's the sort of thing that like, um, what? Sorry guys. I'm distracted. Patrick says that dude is the actor who played Dresden in the TV show. The dude sitting at the table. No, it is not. That guy is from Arrow and he's like the cop. That's the same guy? Seriously? He doesn't look the same at all to me. That's weird. I didn't like... <laughs> he's either aged really badly or really... like I, I'm trying to think about um, how far past the airing of this show it was when he was in Arrow. And he looks pretty like he's had some serious plastic surgery that didn't go awesome um wow i didn't realize that that doesn't it just doesn't look like him at all i would never realize that uh but he is like really smug about this and this is just another like the weirdness of racism in this era and how like only a particular kind of white people was like really you basically had to be english and that was pretty much all that was okay. And if you were anything outside of like British English, that was like some subset of inferior white person. And it just is downhill from there. Um, but Al feels like he has to be really careful about how he handles this. And he's worried about how Seth is also going to handle it and meets with him and is like, dude, you're going to need to be cautious in how you deal because if you roll over too much he's going to essentially think he like runs the place but if you don't at all he's going to see that you are not somebody that he can work with and that's going to make him want to replace you so it's this very fine line that i that makes me personally anxious and nervous because i don't feel like i would cope well with this at all and um so when Seth goes and meets with him, this is so Hurst is really, I gave him too much credit uh, to towards being a decent person. 
he meets with Seth and basically tries to be like, uh, I know what happened in the gym and it's not a big deal. Just let us deal with it ourselves. And Seth has to be like, well, it all really depends on the testimony of the people that I talked to who were there and saw it happen. Like, I can't just take your word on this thing. And then Hearst brings up Alma. And it seems to Seth really clear that he's talking to Seth about Alma, trying to get Seth to bring her a message because he knows already that Seth and Alma have some kind of relationship between the two of them. And he's trying to goad Seth and let him know, I have a little bit of dirt on you that I can blackmail you with. And I just need you to be aware that I completely like have my fingers in all these different pies and I know what's going on. And he, I, I'm forgetting exactly what the message is that he wants um, Seth to bring to Alma, but I have to say that I don't feel like it even ma- Like, I don't, I don't think that message is anything. I think it's a, a pretense to just talk about Alma to Seth. Well, Seth goes downstairs and sees EB and understandably assumes that EB is the one who told Hurst about him and Alma. It's the one time that EB has kept his mouth shut. <laughs> but he, it's so like, really, Seth can so be excused for making this mistake, in my opinion, because EB had this beating coming for several different reasons and has managed to escape it time and time again when he really should not have. And as much as I feel bad for him for like getting his ass whooped for something that he didn't do, there are so many things that he has done and really gotten away with that to a point I'm not even mad about it. Seth grabs EB by the lapels and pulls him over the fucking counter and pounds the man's face in. Like, how many times is Seth going to get mad at a person and then go beat up a different person? That's like his total MO. And it's always, it's always like I'm mad at somebody for pointing out a completely valid thing that I have done wrong. You know, it's like, it's never I'm mad at somebody because they did something unjust and terrible. Like that is something that will enrage Seth, but then he gets to go after the person who did it usually. But more often when Seth's like beating up someone who isn't even necessarily like related to what he's angry about, it's because he's pissed that he is being faced with the consequences of his own behavior and I feel like that more than anything is what's going on here with EB is that he hoped to leave behind what went down with Alma. He and his wife are trying to move on. Alma has gotten married. He is doing his best to live as if this never happened. And here comes this guy who wasn't even in camp when he was involved with Alma throwing it in his face and telling him, essentially, you're never going to get away from this. Like, this is just, that's not happening, buddy. That's something you did. And it's for life. You have to live with it. And you have to live with knowing that people are going to be able to hold it over your head. And I really, I feel for Seth, but I also am starting to lose my patience with the temper that he has on him. He needs to like, get some therapy Find somebody who can teach him some like breathing exercises like Doc Cochran was teaching to Moe's because this guy cannot continue to live in this place with that kind of hair trigger. Like it's it's taking almost nothing to to get his nostrils fucking flaring and his, you know, and then th- this dude like it's a complete theory. Un- I again understand why he thinks that it was EB that did this, but he's got no proof. He completely assumes and has no compunction about pounding the guy's face in. And then later on, when he's talking about it, he is realizing that maybe Hearst didn't know for sure. Maybe Hearst heard some vague rumor 
And the way that he reacted towards Hearst saying something about it has now proven exactly Hearst's suspicions. And he didn't actually have anybody telling him anything. And he fucking fell for it, basically. That has got to sting. To know that you screwed yourself like that and that maybe the person who was coming at you didn't even have anything. It's like that uh, episode of Seinfeld where George gets that cashmere sweater on discount because it's got a red dot on it. And Elaine, he's like denying to Elaine that he even saw the dot. And she tells him, well, Jerry says... You bought it for a discount because of the dot. And he turns around and is like, I can't believe you told her. And Jerry has to be like, I didn't tell her, you stupid idiot. She tricked you. <laughs> um, so Hurst, the fact that he's messing around like this, I figured he had to be a savvy dude. But I just so wanted him to like be better. And I had such hopes that he was better. And now the fact that he's like got no problem with shooting a dude in, in Al's bar. And apparently it's because the guy was trying to organize a union, which, um, hi guys. Can we talk about anti-union sentiment today in the United States and how like there was a half hour portion of training when I worked at Target about how to report somebody who tries to talk to you about unions it's really gross and unions are great and sure they have their problems, but I prefer those problems to the problems of people not being able to live on the money they make while working 40 hours a week. So yeah, fuck Hearst is what I'm saying. Um, I just, I'm, I'm concerned about what this means. And Al is obviously also concerned. He goes and talks to Hearst. He tries to say something about, he, he sort of tries to play it like, this was an unfortunate mistake and I would like to avoid this kind of thing going down in my place again. I'm not mad at you. And I certainly don't think this was purposeful, but, um, you know, it's, it's really like carefully done. Meanwhile, privately Al is like, this guy is trying to come in here and own the camp. And I was willing to deal with him owning the claims and being the richest guy in town. I was fine with him taking over everybody's claims. Like as much as I don't, I, I, as much as I would love to own these claims myself, I don't know anything about this. This isn't my purview. He can have them, but trying to basically like turn this into a dictatorship with him at the helm. Mm -mm, no, we're not having that. And so Alice sort of, trying to walk that line and figure out exactly how he can trip this guy up without actively making an enemy out of him. This dude has such resources, you know, and Alice, Alice playing it a little dumb in order to make Hearst more comfortable and, and confident that he is dealing with somebody who isn't up to his level in terms of skullduggery. And uh, I'm, I can't tell. I think that he's buying it. I think Al's doing a pretty good job of being like, oh, I'm just your local corrupt businessman. Isn't, aren't I jovial? I don't have greater designs. I'm, I don't have a head for politics. I think that Hearst is buying it. I'll be very interested to see how this goes on because Al up against somebody like Hearst is pretty compelling because of the very thing that he says to Dan, which is, don't I... Don't I miss when a draw across the throat was enough to settle things? And yeah, that's not an option with somebody like Hearst. You cannot handle it that way. And that makes Al have to work harder and be more ingenious. And I'm here for that. I like to watch Al be ingenious because he often just like comes up with shit that I'm like, how did you even that's like six steps ahead you're coming from. Um, All right. So. I'm making sure that I'm covering everything here. I have this cat here still. She's just so good, you guys. I can't believe that Mose is like being the um the guard outside of this school. I do not care for that at all, by the way. And I really love the fact that Jane keeps getting on his case about it and yelling at him that he's like scaring the kids. I just find that so hilarious. 
Um, okay, so we'll talk about now the fact that um, Al is working on this whole other little scam where he really, really wants Saul to own a home. And evidently, Silas, like, bought a house with a, you know, a loan or a mortgage and is is playing it up like he can't afford it and won't Saul ease his mind and take it off him. And it's all because Al is pretty invested in Saul being able to win this election. And it he thinks it does not look good for Saul to be living at his business premises. It just doesn't give off the vibe of somebody who's like settled and doing well. And... Yet he doesn't just want to like talk to Saul about it. He's trying to trick him into taking over this home. And it's really amazing how Trixie sees right fucking through Silas's little pantomime that he does here. Because he really does lay it on a little bit thick with the panic that he's about to like completely like go berserk and uh, is so, so desperate. And she follows him out into the thoroughfare and is like, really? Is this what you're going to do? You're just going to like, you're you're going to do this over the top bullshit and hope that we don't notice like we're fucking children and we can't tell that you're full of shit. It's insulting. Can we not? And she goes and talks to Al about it. And Al basically says to her, well, you will live in the adjoining building, which is the hotel that uh, Joni has been staying in. You'll live there. He will live in that house. They are connected by a little like breezeway type thing. And what you can do is sneak in to see him at night. And you can continue your affair without him publicly being involved with you, which will be bad for his reputation. And it's one of those awful things where she totally understands, obviously, she's not an idiot. Trixie understands the practicality of what he's saying, but it's so insulting. It's like, you know, she's like a piece of furniture you know, that that he is ashamed of and he loves sitting in and using, but he doesn't want anybody to know about it. And it's just so like dehumanizing and gross and treating her like a tool. And Al, I think, is low key hoping to like drive a bit of a wedge between her and Saul with this, because I think as much as Al is mostly over the fact that she is spending all of her time over there now. I think he resents a little bit that she seems to have real feelings for Saul. And he wants to underline the fact that she's just a whore still. Like, I feel like there's a little pettiness there. I really do. Um, Patrick says like grandma fucking groundhog. Yeah. When Trixie goes and like explains all of this to Saul, she is animated because she's very upset. And bless Saul, he has such a slow pickup. Like, he is so, he's so far behind her. Like, she's as quick as Al is on the on the pickup on a lot of this stuff, you know? She's learned from being around him and she's an intelligent woman of in her own right. And this whole, like, business of her having to explain everything to Saul because he's such a naive baby in a lot of ways is really amusing to me. Her having to be like, dude, do you not see what's going on here? And him being like, no, I, I genuinely don't like, Oh, Saul, you sweet little summer child. Um, Oh, you guys, can we just, I know nobody is here in the live chat except for Patrick, but this cat right now is just so cuddled up and I cannot handle it. This is such like, she's so relaxed. I can't believe she's still here after all this. Um, so yeah, this, this argument that she gets in with Al about it, she's just so pissed. It's, 
lovely to see how angry she gets, honestly. She Shaughnessy's, that's the name of the hotel. That's the name of the guy who runs it. So I guess they just call it Shaughnessy's. Um, but yeah, so when she goes and like yells at Saul and he's literally standing there with his mouth hanging open, like he has, uh, all right. So in comes Bullock. He's talking to, he's, he's talking to, um, Al about everything before he goes and sees Hearst. And I forgot like how far into the episode this actually happens because he beats up EB little like about halfway through the episode. I thought of it as the very beginning, but it really is like halfway through. Um, And I keep forgetting exactly how like, un like unwilling Seth is to sort of want to associate himself with Al, but also trying to make peace with the fact that if he wants what's best for the camp, it's a it's a combination of just like I have to deal with this guy because he's got a lot of power, but also like a I think a bit of grudging respect that I don't like Al and I think he's a bad person in a lot of ways, but also he is right about a lot of things and he's pretty smart. And even though I think his interests are not coming from a place of purity and wanting what's best for people for the sake of it, in the end, we are both on the side of wanting what's best for the camp. And I have to sort of function within that. And I like seeing Seth struggle with that because that's sort of the struggle that a lot of us have to deal with in life is like, is, is being partnered with people and working with people that we know aren't doing things for the right reasons, or we know aren't really good people, but there's a job to be done and we need them to get it done. And you sometimes have to set things aside and just put your head down, you know? Um, all right. So let's talk about what's going on with Alma because she is obviously in some pain. Um, when she sends out Ellsworth to get a blanket out of one of her trunks for the city. And I got the vibe that she just really, wanted to be alone for a little while and was sort of sending him on an errand to get him out from her house a bit, to be honest. It's sort of weird to see the relationship between the two of them, because as much as he is technically married to her now, there's still a quality of him being her servant and employee to the way that they interact that I find really like awkward and strange. It's understandable, but it's also just so like reestablishing the the boundaries of their relationship is obviously not a priority for her because she feels like I got married to him for the appearances of it and I don't really care about anything else changing and I can't help but wonder if Ellsworth did want something else to change I feel like Ellsworth has more feelings for her than he is letting anybody know including himself. I think he does not want to face his own feelings for her. Um, <laughs> this kitten has passed the fuck out. Ah, you guys, this is so wonderful. So he goes away. He um, leads Sophia to school and then heads on his errand and comes back. And Alma is passed out on the floor. I did not think that she was dead, but I got very upset at the sight of her like, sprawled out like this. So of course he runs and gets a doc and the doc is talking to her. He wants her to deal with the pain by taking this medicine. And she's clearly really paranoid that there's going to be opium in what she's drinking and that it's going to get her hooked again. And he has to be like, listen, you need to trust me. I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to put you in a position where you need to like, worry about getting hooked again but you do need to trust that I'm a doctor I know what I'm doing and I'm trying to help you cope with the pain and I just love the doc so much I wish he had more to do in the the most recent episodes because he is just such a he's such a compelling character and he's so he's so grounded so much of the time 
in a way that literally nobody else seems to be that he's almost supernatural in a way. Like he has this quality of being like a watcher from like another dimension who's just keeping an eye on things and stepping in when he needs to. Um, but he comes out finally and tells Ellsworth, she's not an imminent danger. You don't need to worry. She's not going to pass out or she's not going to pass. And the baby is also okay. She's still pregnant. She didn't lose the baby. Um, and Ellsworth's like, I did see blood on the floor. And he says, yeah, she bled a little, but it wasn't as much as you think. And you need to keep her in bed. And you also need to keep her taking the medicine because she's going to be a little resistant to that. And it's important that she keep taking it. So whether or not she's afraid, you need to make sure she does. And he says, and you must remain strong at her side. Um, so Ellsworth has to go and get Sophia from school and uh, asks the doctor to stay with Alma. And I feel like that's the last we see of the doc this episode. Um, oh, yeah, that's who. Because I was talking earlier about Seth saying, I think I might have tipped my hand and let Hurst know that he was right about his assumption about me and Alma. And I thought he was talking to Saul, but he was talking to Charlie Utter. I completely forgot that, that, that this conversation happens. I love the way that he says, I just beat Farnham. Like, he, you can hear in his voice, like a fucking idiot. Like, he doesn't say it, but he so clearly thinks it. Um, and Charlie, bless him, is trying so hard to be supportive. And it's just like, well, you know, he uh, if he tattled on you, then I would have fucking killed him. So good for you. And it's not until Seth has to be like, I don't think he actually told him anything. I think I fucked up. And Charlie has to sort of subside and be like, oh, hmm. Well, it doesn't really know what to say. And then Seth says, I don't think I'm going to run. I think I am unsuited because my fucking temper gets the better of me all the time. And it's just a bad scene for me to constantly be like snapping on people this way. And Charlie acknowledges that that is a problem. But he also points out that for, like, as far as being sheriff, that's not an entirely terrible quality to have. You maybe need that sometimes you need a temper, you need to be violent to deal with certain people. And then points out that, you know, Harry's a decent guy, but you've seen how stupid he is sometimes. Do you really think he's better for the camp than you are? Because it's just down between the two of you. It's not like some perfect candidate is going to suddenly materialize because you've decided you don't want to do this anymore. Um, And Seth really seems to hear that and take it to heart. So... They later on are like planning their speeches when they find out that it's been canceled because EB is supposed to make one and he can't go up there looking the way he does after getting his ass beat like that. Like, yeah. Um, so there's a really cool bit with Jane and Martha. Again, I would like to say how much I enjoy Martha being inclusive of all of the variety of women that are in this camp because she invites or like in the last season, she invites Trixie to come and sit with them and eat, which I think Trixie kept her distance thinking that this woman does not approve of me and will not want to share a table with me. And it, Martha is very much like, you can come and join us, please. Like, you know, really trying to let her know this is fine. You're a person. It's it's totally cool. And then with this encounter with Jane, she's like, obviously, you have had some adventures. Kids love adventures. I am a teacher. How about we sit down together and you tell me some of the crazy stories of the shit that you've been through and we can put them together into a little book and, and tell the children about everything that you've experienced. Genius idea. 
And I love when Jane says something about it to Joni. Joni's like, shit, I want to hear these stories. Like, yeah, you should definitely do this. So Martha is just, I'm really warming to her a lot. I've, I've pretty much liked her since the start, but she's a slow character to, to get to know because she is so reserved. But everything that I learn about her, I just really feel like she's handling things very sensibly and carefully. And the fact that she is reserved is really probably the smart way to be considering her station and, and her who she's married to and what she represents for this camp. So I'm excited about getting to hear what's going on with Jane and like what she's been through. She when they mention Custer, Jane is like, Oh, that guy. Yeah. No, he's a complete douchebag. He sent me to scout, but he didn't want to listen to anything that I had to say. And he just basically did whatever the fuck he wanted and screwed everybody else. Like, yeah, he was awful. But also, probably her stories are really interesting and I want to hear them and I'm excited about it. Um, I'm trying to think, see if there's anything else that I missed here, because we have Seth coming in and talking to Martha for a second after Jane leaves. And... There's something going on with Seth rubbing his nose when he's like nervous or anxious about something. She asks him, how was your meeting with Mr. Hurst? And he puts up his hand to like rub his face again, the way that he did when he was talking to Hurst. And you can see like the bloody knuckles that he's caught. And I can't help but feel like he's telling her everything he needs to with that moment. Um, But yeah, I'm wondering what that tick is, because I feel like we haven't seen that in the past that he does that when he's upset. Um, and Trixie goes to see Alma, uh, while Ellsworth is away taking care of some other stuff. And she straight up asks Alma, listen, do you really want this baby? Can I tell you all how much I love Trixie? I swear to God, I love her so much. She's like the MVP of the show in a lot of ways, but she's straight up like, were you low key hoping that maybe you would lose the baby? And I'm not judging you. I really am not. But you're in a position where this is not the the child of the man you're married to. You are probably experiencing a lot of pain. Things are uncertain. And maybe you just want this off your hands. And if that's true, I understand. And we can deal with that. And Alma is like, no, I really, really want this baby. And Trixie is like, okay. If that's what you want, then we will make that happen too. But you need to listen to the fucking doctor. So stop trying to get up and do shit. Stop trying to act like you're fine. You're not fine. You have a difficult pregnancy ahead of you. You're barely halfway through. You need to listen to other people and you need to accept some help. And Alma sort of like, okay, mom. Like, it's it's great. I love seeing her get sort of reamed out by Trixie, who's just not going to She's not going to deal with any bullshit from anybody. Trixie is here to tell you how it is. And that is it. Um, So we have the moment where Al comes and talks to EB and demands to know the truth about whether or not he told Hearst what was going on. EB swears up and down he didn't. And it seems like Al believes him and I believe him. So then we have the meet between Hearst and uh, or no, we have a, a meet between Merrick. That's right. Merrick comes into the bar and talks to Swearingen. Um, and he tries to tell Merrick that we're going to be postponing the speeches. And Merrick is really bummed about it and wants to know why. And Al has to basically be like, uh, it's none of your fucking business. So, you know, go have a drink, go get laid for free. And stop asking me these questions because you're going to get information when you get it. Um, so let's go to finally the talk between Hearst and Al. He's doing his little like, you know, affable criminal bit. Um, the dude behind uh, behind Hearst goes by Captain Turner. I am very interested in Captain Turner. What's his deal exactly? I want to see more of what he does and takes care of. Um, 
But Al is like saying, no, 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 you can keep your guy in here. This is fine. And I wonder if he doesn't want to um, keep Cap here because he's hope. You hear me calling him Cap like he's Captain America. Keep Captain here because he's maybe likely to go out and gossip. And Al kind of wants this news to get out or to make it seem like the captain is responsible for the news getting out. Um, but I have a feeling that this guy is going to play into Al's plan somehow. So they're drinking and Al says, today's events gave me pause, which is a very careful way of saying this. Um, he talks about the beating of Farnham and, uh, where does the sheriff get off doing something like that to one of your own? Which I love the fact that he acts like he's not on Seth's side in this at all. Um, and it's just like, wow, the indignity of it. Like, wow, I'm totally respectful of the people that work for you. And I would never. And I can't believe that he had the gall. It's just great. Um, so Hearst says... Um, he He says that he knows about the shooting with the um, Cornishman. And I love the way that Al decides to set this up. He says, it felt like a put up job to me and I am concerned about you and tries to make it seem like maybe this whole thing is like a plot against Hearst. Like he doesn't know and is not aware that Hearst is testing him. <sighs> Al, you're good. You're good. And he says, I have learned to accept, Mr. Swearingen, that events sharing some effect on my interests does not make them part of a plot. And Al says, oh, so you don't think that you're the center of the universe? Doesn't that bum you out? Uh, Al, you are so damn good, man. Um, Bullock beating Farnham seems more likely some expression of a private feeling of his own. Um. So then he says, all right, well, that leaves the, the shooting in the bar. Um, and he says, maybe the Cornish themselves were the object of the violence and sort of leads Hearst down the path to saying, yeah, they do tend to try and organize unions a lot, which is not something that I'm super into. Uh, he asks, do you have strong feelings on the subject? Very cautiously, to which, of course, Al says, I don't care about unions, whatever. I don't have any objection to killing Cornish either. <sighs> Al, trying to play ugh, like he doesn't like. Mm, OK, but bloodletting on my premises that I ain't approved. I take as a fucking affront. It puts me off my feed. And Hurst seems to hear this and says, well, what does that look like when you are put off your feed? And Al says, I start tearing things down. And I canceled the election speeches for tomorrow. And if things aren't put right, I'm going to continue to fuck with the elections and the agreement with Yankton. Basically puts it all on the table. Let the camp return to its former repute, unstable and unsafe. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoyed the the fact that he just sort of, he says to himself, he says to Hearst about himself, I'm definitely dangerous. I am not somebody who has the kind of power that you have, but. I will act against people who act against my interests. I can't argue with dangerous. And I feel like he's being as upfront as he can be without showing his entire hand and being like, I'm a lot smarter than you think I am. And her says, then I hope I'll hope your insult is cured to spare the camp any danger of however brief a duration and to look. F uh, and Al says, to look for one fucking instant out the other end of the telescope, once placated. I'm meek as a babe. Hmm. Are you? And he picks up the bottle and drinks the rest of it and puts it down and then leaves. And you can see Hurst. 
he's a tiny bit shook. Um, he's just, he, it feels like he doesn't quite know how to handle somebody who's up in his grill the way that Al just was. And he's like, all right, you're going to have to go and talk to those guys, even though, uh, he put them up to this job. He's like, perhaps they'd care to pay another visit to the saloon. I think I'll want to hear the talk. What does that mean? I'm really, I'm really interested to see how Hearst handles this. I'm not excited about it, to be honest, but I'm interested. So I think I covered everything. I'm nervous about it. Um, thank you very, very much again to Patrick for commissioning this. And I hope that you guys are enjoying the coverage of it. I've been having a really good time watching this show. And it's been fun having an episode um, like three times a week. So I'm getting to watch them really quickly on top of each other. So, yeah, thank you all again. Thank you, Patrick. And I will be seeing you all again next week with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs> Spoiled Network Podcast.